exciting new discoveries in the field of archaeology of Egyptian mummies and ancient Egyptians has been found this May 2017 when the first complete genome data extracted from ancient Egyptian mummies was made possible. The study finds that ancient Egyptians were closely related to ancient populations from the Middle East and Western Asia or the Caucasian populations of the Levant in Greece and Rome. The combined use of artifacts, textual evidence, and ancient DNA data allows a more holistic study of past identities and cultural exchange. This is by Paul Van Pelt. He's the co-author along with the Max Planck Institute. An international team of researchers have successfully recovered and analyzed ancient DNA from Egyptian mummies dating from approximately 1400 BC to 400 BC including the first genome-wide data from three individuals. The study found that modern Egyptians share more ancestry with sub-Saharan Africans than ancient Egyptians did, whereas ancient Egyptians were found to be more closely related to ancient people from Middle East and Western Asia. So they had less sub-Saharan DNA. This study counters prior skepticism about the possibility of recovering reliable ancient DNA from ancient Egyptian mummies, despite the potential issues of degradation and cont contamination caused by climate and mummification methods. The authors were able to use high throughput DNA sequencing and robust authentication methods to ensure the ancient origin and reliability of the data. The study published by the journal Nature Communication shows that Egyptian mummies can be a reliable source of ancient DNA and can contribute to a more accurate and refined understanding of Egypt's history. Egypt is a promising location for the study of ancient populations. It is rich and well-documented history and its geographic location and many interactions with populations from surrounding areas in Africa, Asia, and Europe make it a dynamic region. Recent advances in the study of ancient DNA present an opportunity to test e existing understandings of Egyptian history using ancient genetic data. However, genetic studies of ancient Egyptian mummies are rare due to methodological and contamination issues. Although some of the first extractions of ancient DNA were from mummified remains, scientists have raised doubts as to whether the genetic data, especially the nuclear DNA, which encodes for the majority of the genome from the mummies, would be reliable and whether it could be recovered at all. A quote, the potential preservation of DNA has to be regarded with skepticism, says Juanes Krauss, director at the Max Planck Institute for Science of Human History and senior author of this study. The hot Egyptian climate, the high humidity levels in many tombs, and some of the chemicals used in mummification, mummification techniques contribute to DNA degradation and are thought to make a long-term survival of DNA in the Egyptian mummies unlikely. And that does come into effect, especially with the skin and organs and the fact that they really have been hollowed out and turned into a mannequin type effect and there is not much meat on the bone, as to say. And so they've had to go internal for bones and teeth to find this and it's how they get it out of all the ancient cavemen and things like that but they get usually incomplete sequences they've been able to complete sequences now off of it and really tell you what these people were and not some broken down part and it's been replicated enough to where they uh, realize that they do have exactly the extracted DNA and the methods they use then are now passed on now this is a paper that came out in uh, May of this year, but as of June or July of this year, they had run another 42 mummies, or in the in the way that they worded it, it may in, indicate that these three were part of the 42 and that they had only done 39 more. But in that genome study, it seems to even refine it down more and more and more. And they even have King Tut's DNA too, but let's look at this. For the study, the team led by the University of Tübingen and the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History in Germany and including researchers from the University of Cambridge looked at genetic differentiation 
and population continuity over a 1300 year time span and compared these results to modern populations. The reason they chose this is because they had already figured out, as modern people have, that the Sub-Saharan uh, Nubians came in at around 700 BC and took over for about a 93 period, uh, year period which the Akkadians came in after that took over, followed by the Persians, and those Persian Arabs are still the people that are there here today. And they have real good genome studies on the people that are here today. And so what they've done is been able to compare this and find out the differentiation of the two. The team sampled 151 mummy individuals from the archaeological site of Abersur el Melek along the Nile River in Middle Egypt from two anthropological sections and curated at the University of Tübingen at Felix von Vachal Skull Collection at the Museum of Prehistory at the Stradlich Museum zu Berlin, Zifsuken Presekur Kabelitze. I can't pronounce this German crap, people. Um, but what's important about here is they went to Absur el Melek. And of course, if you know anything about the Bible, Melek is a, a ruler and something that the uh, you know people in the Canaanites worshipped and so on. And so is El. El is the god of the Levant. And he was worshipped in temp Els and uh, had things called angels with wings on them. And all their names had El in them too, like uh, um, Airy El and uh, things like that. You know, they, uh, and uh, so that's a Canaanite religion that we're looking at there. And, uh, it's what's actually in your Bible, too. If you look up L, you'll find out that he was Saturn and that the ancient Greeks and Romans, um, Romans worshipped Saturn, too. They thought he was their primordial god that made everything happen. He was the god of rain, god of time. Saturn and Kronos are equated, and through this you get the idea that that's their primordial overlord thing, and it comes through the whole Levant area here. All of these people have the same belief and a dogmatic system that goes on and really very close to Egyptian. And um, so let's look on through here, though. I don't want to go off too, mu too much farther on onto that. In total, the authors recovered partial genomes within 90 individuals and genome-wide data tests from three individuals. They were able to use that data gathered with a test previous hypothesis drawn from the logical and historical data from these studies of modern DNA. In particular, we are interested in looking at the changes and continuities in the genetic makeup of the ancient inhabitants of Abersel el Melek, said Alexander Peltzer, one of the lead authors of the study from the University of Tübingen. The team wanted to determine if the investigated ancient populations were affected at the genetic level by foreign conquest and domination during the time period that's under study and compare these populations to modern Egyptian comparative populations. So what they were looking for is seeing the Nubian influence and see how much effect it had on it. And then, of course, the following Greek and things that come after. And so you, they would see this big dynamic happen probably, right? And by using the partial genomes of 90 and comparing it to the full data sets that they had, they can see where those lie inside the, the genome set and then now really compare what they really have. And things wouldn't be nipped off and out of place, but actually well placed. There's literary and archaeological evidence for foreign influence at the site, including the presence of individuals with Greek and Latin names and the use of foreign material culture, said co-author W. Paul Van Pelt from Cambridge's Division of Archaeology. However, neither of these provides direct evidence for the presence of foreigners or of individuals with a migrational background because many markers of Greek and Roman identity became status symbols and were adopted by natives and foreigners alike. So there was a lot of monkey see, monkey do. The combined use of artifacts, textual evidence, and ancient DNA data allows a more holistic study of the past identities and culture exchange for entanglement. The study found that inhabitants of Absar el Malik were more closely related to ancient populations in the Levant and were closely related to Neolithic populations from Anatolian Peninsula and Europe. The genetics of Absur el Melek community did not go any major shifts during the 1300-year 13 13 time span we studied, suggesting that the population remained genetically relatively unaffected 
by foreign conquest and rule, said Wolfgang Hock, group leader at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History and a co-author of this paper. Now, one thing you can infer from this if you read the whole paper is that what they're saying is, is that whenever the people that were Caucasian that came in and mixed with them, that it didn't really change much. And that oddly led to the idea, concept, and reality that the earlier Egyptians were pretty much these same people. Therefore, even though they had inferences by a few different versions of these same Anatolian Levant European people, it did not change their DNA to any subsequent amount. And the last paragraph here, the data shows that modern Egyptians share approximately 8% more ancestry on the nuclear level with sub-Saharan African populations than the hab inhabitants of Absur el Melek, suggesting that an increase in sub-Saharan African gene flow into Egypt occurred within the last 2,000 years or since A.D., Possible causal factors may have been improved mobility down the Nile River, increased long-distance trade between sub-Saharan Africa and Egypt, and the trans-Saharan slave trade that began approximately 1,300 years ago. Not 400 like the African Americans think in, in America, but it actually had started way back at that time there, and that's how you get some of the influence off of it, and perhaps people having sex with the girls that infers it, but they get 8% more ancestry or 8% more sub-Saharan and the max that they have in that area on, on a uh, scale would be 16%. Now, interestingly, we all share about 6 to 8% of sub-Saharan DNA, or actually you could infer by this that sub-Saharans contain the same 8% as the Caucasoids do does not have to stem from Africa. It can come from either direction. It's common. It's not from one. It's common among two. By the way, we are somewhat, uh, I, I think if the, my numbers are correct, we're somewhat like 88% exactly as common as a banana. Black people and white people. It's DNA and genomes and genetics. But of course, the difference between that is quite a bit. There's a 1% difference between a common bonobo or a chimpanzee and our modern primate selves that we are now. And that 1% means a hell of a lot, apparently. So this shows that there was very little, if none, sub-Saharan DNA prior to 700 BC, a small amount comes in at that point, and the amount that we see today is 8% more strong sub-Saharan African due to the slave trade that had happened up to 1300 years ago or after 700 AD, 1400 years later. And the inferred knowledge out of this is that ancient Egyptians were even more Caucasoid than the current population that exists there today. So we could look at some of the faces that they have of ancient Egypt and see what they actually show. Let's look up somebody who's going to gear towards this slightly. Hmm, these are some of my videos. And there definitely are Caucasian pharaohs of Egypt. I'll just click on this guy's video. I don't know. I've seen the other ones before, but... Yeah, exactly. Yes, they share a common ancestor with these pharaohs. 
Well, talk about those common ancestors. Uh, where were they from? Who were they exactly? Uh, we think they lived around the Black Sea or maybe in the Caucasus, but we, we don't know exactly where they lived. But um, um, this, this group was founded by one man who lived about 9,500 years ago in this area, around the Black Sea, but we can't, we can't tell exactly at this point of time. Is this surprising? Yes, yes, it is very surprising because uh, we didn't know that um, this uh, lineage of Tutankhamun came from the Black Sea or from Anatolia or the Caucasus because it, it, uh, yeah, well, it didn't come from Egypt. And they, that, this was surprising for us, yes. I'm sure it is quite surprising for a lot of people who had different ideals onto it. But I don't know if you remember the old King Tut song, but it said King Tut, born in Babylonia, moved to Macedonia, King Tut. And uh, Babylonian people are definitely Caucasians. I mean, they have a lot of blue eyes and their features are very much so. But you look at these ancient Egyptian statues and that's very Caucasian features too. The eyes always have somewhat of an Asian look to them. But if you knew that they crushed up emeralds and little glass stones and rubbed them on their eyes for eyeshadow, you would see why they probably have a little bit of a puffy eyelid or problems with them. And the depiction of the eye is drawn from using the, the eyeliner that they used at the time, or it made your eyes exaggerated like this. Much like Egyptian ladies and Mexican girls and a lot of people do now with that slight cat, cat eye look. And it's the way that you form your eye with creosote and the uh, darkening agents that you use around your eyes and stuff. I mean, they can use henna and things, but no, henna is more of a, a reddish opaque. This is uh, the black stuff that they rub around their eyes. And apparently it had a reflective quality, much like baseball players use today a little bit more efficiently and less beautified. But wouldn't it be odd today if men still wore makeup like this and whenever you think about baseball players, they'd all have Egyptian makeup on. And it would be very important that after every round, they would go in and get their makeup redone. <laughs> kind of a strange way of thinking of things. But yeah, um, pretty important. I'm not gonna watch the rest of this video. I just wanted to show that DNA genetic study. And this of course shows you the King Tut genetic study. So, y'all enjoy. Subscribe if you will. Like if you like it. If you don't like the information, I'm sorry. But truth and reality are going to have to be enjoyed and liked because that's the truth and reality of things. You can't go on living lies. Peace.